As we move to the next panel, there should be a natural continuation of the themes that were highlighted in the last conversation, as we're joined by Rudy De Leon, Dove Zakheim, and Ambassador Eric Edelman, who also serves on FBI's Board of Directors, for our conversation about how to sustain and strengthen America's world-leading defense capabilities. I thank these gentlemen, along with Bradley Penniston, who will introduce and moderate our speakers, uh, introduce our speakers and moderate the conversation. Brad is the editor of Armed Forces Journal, a journal of ideas and strategy that has been published since 1863, so congratulations to them on 150th anniversary. He's written extensively about the U.S. Navy and has written for the Navy Times and Defense News before taking the helm at AFJ. Bradley, if you will. Thanks very much. Well, friends, we live in interesting times, as the Chinese curse has it. We've left Iraq, we're drawing down in Afghanistan, we're still pursuing Al-Qaeda and similar groups in other nations. Syria is burning, China is rising, although it certainly is not settled to what degree as rival or partner. Climate change is altering natural and man-made systems, and the world is changing. Uh, globalization's interdependencies have entwined us productively and yet made us in some ways more brittle. Um, our communications web that enables so much commerce and so much good also allows the spread of violent ideas and at unimaginable speed. Uh, Keith Walker, the general who runs the Army's Arctic Concept Development Center, put it this way, the momentum of human interaction is increasing exponentially. So the security environment is changing and our military services, which have spent much of the past decade relearning the lessons of counterinsurgency and then expanding upon them, are now trying to figure out what they should be five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. But the strategy side is just half of it, because after a decade in which military funds were all but limitless, budgets are down again. And moreover, it was a buildup in which uh, we did not recapitalize our arsenal. The US has emerged from a decade of war with fewer and older aircraft, fewer and older ships, thousands of combat vehicles now abandoned in foreign lands. Instead of getting larger, as CSBA's Todd Harrison puts it, our military has become smaller, older, and more expensive. So no longer can the military do it all, if in fact it ever could. And matching our national ambitions with our defense budget requires serious prioritization, or perhaps innovation. Do we sacrifice near-term capacity to build long-term capability? Do we learn to rely on allies and partners to, in a, to a degree and in a way once thought unimaginable? Do we accept that the US military must wait, make its way uh, in the world with diminished capacity. Now, during his last few months in office, Defense Secretary Robert Gates, uh, who led the way in making the first round of Obama administration cuts, was known to say, essentially, tell me what we're not going to do anymore. So, our panel's remit is, what defense do we need? And I would add, what defense can we afford? And we want, of course, a strategy-driven, resource-informed solution. Now, there's another twist to this that I'll just mention briefly. A budget process has gone from cumbersome to counterproductive to slightly insane. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Anyway, you could not ask for a better panel to help us figure this all out. So the gentlemen on my right really need no introduction, and yet I'm a slave to orthodoxy, so I will offer one. Um, on my right, we have Rudy DeLeon. His term as Deputy Secretary of Defense under President Bill Clinton capped a quarter century of government service that also included posts of Deputy Undersecretary for Personnel and Readiness and Undersecretary of the Air Force. Before that, he was on congressional staff, holding various positions up to and including staff director for the House Armed Services Committee. And he helped put together the landmark Goldwater-Nichols Act. After leaving government service, he ran Boeing's Washington office for several years as a senior vice president, and currently he is senior vice president of national security and international policy at the Center for American Progress here in Washington. I'm going to ask Rudy to speak for five minutes, and then I'll introduce the next members of the panel, and then we will get to our conversation. Well, uh, Brad, thank you for the invitation, and I thank the sponsors uh, for the chance to come here and to participate in a very important discussion this morning in terms of how to be thinking about the defense budget, how to look ahead, and really, um, we're in one of those times where we need to recalibrate. Uh, the period dominated by Iraq and Afghanistan is coming to an end, although we have to remember we still have combat troops in Afghanistan, and their uh, NATO exit in 2014 is something that we need to have a real clear focus on. But moving beyond that, uh, we've got a, a risen China in the Asia Pacific, 
We have Asia Pacific as the center of global commerce, the center of the recovery from uh, the economic slowdown, and um, a series of uh, unusual economic alliances, and yet uh, the military alliances and strategically the security of Asia still revolve around the United States. We have a Middle East that is as complicated as ever, uh, including a civil war in Syria, uh, preliminary diplomacy dealing with Iran, but unease among uh, our Gulf neighbors, um, and you know the perennial question of uh, the West Bank and the Palestinians uh, and their status. But all of those issues, as critical as they are, um, we're in the middle of perhaps the most complicated and chaotic budget process that I think our uh, national security has seen since the end of World War II. And that's a huge period with lots of puts and takes. First, you know, DOD is the most sophisticated of the government agencies. It usually works off of something called the future year's defense budget. Five to six years making long range decisions when Secretary Cheney and Secretary Aspen looked at the post Cold War uh, defense cuts. They were able to do it in a strategic environment and to set the direction for those budget alterations uh, and then execute them across a decade. Now we've gone from the period of the five-year defense plan <coughs> to continuing resolutions, which were for a while six months. Now they're four months in duration. Uh, add to that the sequester, which is the product of the uh, debt ceiling compromise two years ago. Um, to quote Leon Panetta as he was departing as Secretary of Defense in his Georgetown U University comments, he said, we can no longer go from budget crisis to budget crisis. And he said, this is not a game. Uh, that coming from a Secretary of Defense who had unique skills, but perhaps our shrewdest budget uh, expert in the US government. So. Figuring out a path forward in terms of how to create budget stability and what that top line is. And just one last comment. If we look at the sequester, that's a trillion dollars worth of cuts off of 10 years. Now, the president has put an alternative number down. It's a little bit more than 500 billion over those 10 years. So there's a huge gap between how the Congress sees the future defense budget and how the president does uh, in terms of the magnitude of the cuts that Congress is imposing through the sequester. So a very dynamic and very challenging time. The rest of the world will not stop while we try to get our budget act. Thanks, Rudy. And to Rudy's right, we have Dr. Dov Zakheim, uh, another man who needs no introduction, but I will deliver one anyway. He is a former Pentagon comptroller, that is to say, Under Secretary of Defense. Among his other DOD posts have been Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Planning and Resources. And from 2004, 2002 to 2004, he was DOD's coordinator of civilian programs in Afghanistan. Earlier in his career, he was a defense and foreign policy analyst in the Congressional Budget Office. And after leaving government service, he became a senior vice president of Booz Allen Hamilton. Today, he's a senior fellow at CNA, senior advisor at Center for Strategic, Strategic and International Studies. He chairs the National Intelligence Council, one of their advisory panels. He's a member of the Commission on Wartime Contracting in Afghanistan. He's on the Defense Business Board, which he helped found. And I think you get the idea. So without further ado, Dov, why don't you well, give us your piece? Thanks very much, Brad. And full disclosure, uh, Eric Edelman, Ambassador Edelman, and I co-authored an op-ed not long ago. Rudy and I have been on radio a while back. And so I think what you're going to hear, because this is very important, um, you're going to hear shades of, of difference. but. For the last 60 years, there's been a fundamental consensus about the United States strategy, which is forward, which involves allies and friends, which involves across the board deterrence, and as Rudy just said, which involved relatively stable budgets. There is so much uncertainty now, and because there is, we tend to be uh, I believe overly pessimistic as well. And let me explain what I mean. To begin with, there's always going to be uncertainty about where we fight. Uh, other than 
World War II, Korea was unpredictable. One could argue about Vietnam, but certainly we got into it, it far more than we thought. Just about every war we fought, other perhaps than going into Iraq deliberately and going into Panama deliberately in 89, were not things we expected to fight. Which means that we can't be certain about what kinds of tools we're going to use which also means you've got to be very careful about what you throw out of the toolbox. We've become certain in a different way, though, about what we've, some people call multipolarity, and they keep talking about the BRICS, which is to say the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians, the Brazilians, and maybe the South Africans. Every one of those countries is having economic problems now. And there's no indication that they're going to get out of those economic problems anytime soon. Their gross domestic products have leveled off, if not tailed off. Their populations are restive. So that kind of prediction, that somehow the United States will be less powerful because others are becoming more powerful, I'm not sure holds water. But to the contrary, and this goes to some of the budget concerns we've got, I don't believe the issue is dealing with a 10-year sequester. I don't think anybody believes that. And one of the reasons that I don't is because within five years, we're supposedly going to have a very different energy profile, which, oh, by the way, means there's going to be a lot more in the way of taxes coming into the government, a lot more revenue. And therefore, when we think about defense, we have to be careful not to cut those things that will be impossible to replenish once the money starts coming in again. And I'm not sure we've focused sufficiently on that. Because right now, all the talk is about, well, for instance, we don't want to fight another land war. Guess what? MacArthur said that. We said that after Vietnam. Now Bob Gates has said it. We don't know if we're not going to fight another land war. Nobody knows. As I said, we don't know where we're going to fight next. How far you cut back on that is a very open question in my mind. Then we say, well, you know, we can rely on special operations and on cyber and on space, and that's all true. The issue is, to what extent do we rely? Don't we need other things? Whether we worry about China or Iran or many other places, we seem to constantly call upon the carriers and the carrier task forces to do the job for us. Is this the right time to be cutting carriers or cutting the Navy or cutting the Air Force, which is trying, to some extent at least, to work with the Navy on these things. And if you look at Asia, you understand why. So we've got to think differently about what we plan to do today and what we're planning for. I believe what we ought to be doing is think about how we get from here to there over the next few years till the money starts to come in again. Not because there'll be another war, which has usually been the trigger for money, but because there'll simply be more money there. And we have to be very careful not to cut our noses off to spite our face. And that means thinking, yes, about efficiencies, but not necessarily about old shibboleths that we want to cut. And I'll give you one final example before my time runs out. I have seen many, many analysts say, we really ought to stop spending money on, ground, on, on uh, what we used to call national missile defense, GMD. That we really should stop. It hasn't done anything for us. And yet this very administration, which is full of people who have written and said that for decades, as soon as North Korea threatened to hit the United States, whether they could do it or not, decided it wanted to buy more of these missiles. And that's my point. Once you get rid of something, it's very hard to get it back. So let's be awfully cautious about what we get rid of. Thanks, Bill. And furthest to my right, Ambassador Eric Edelman, career foreign service officer, wide range of jobs have taken him from the ambassadorships to Finland and Turkey, all the way back to the wilds of the Pentagon and the White House. He was Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in the Bush administration. He has also served as Principal Deputy Assistant to the Vice President for National Security Affairs. Eric retired from the Foreign Service in 2009. Today, he's a Distinguished Fellow at the Center for 
strategic and budgetary assessments, a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins Phillips Merrill Center, an associate at Harvard's Belfer Center, and again, you get the idea. Eric, please. Brad, <clears throat> thank you very much. And as a member of the board of uh, FPI, let me just say how pleased I am to be on a panel with um, two uh, great public servants, uh, Rudy DeLeon and, and Dove Zakheim, both of whom I have had the privilege and pleasure of working with um, in the past. The uh, title of our panel, and I agree, of course, with um, most of what um, has been said before me, and I certainly hope Dove is right, uh, that we're not going to be dealing with a 10-year sequester and that the money is going to start coming in again in the future. Um, I, I don't think we should necessarily plan on that, but that would be a happy problem to have. Let, let me start by uh, saying that uh, the title of the panel was what kind of defense does the United States need? And Brad added what kind of defense can we afford? So let me just make a couple of comments about both and then hopefully we can um, get into the discussion part. Uh, Rudy and I, uh, three years ago, served together on the congressionally uh, created independent panel to review the Department of Defense's 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review. Um, and the panel we served on was uh, made up of uh, 20 members. It was bipartisan. It was co-chaired by uh, Bill Perry and Steve Hadley. Uh, and it uh, articulated uh, their set of things it thought the United States had traditionally done and still needed to do. And among those were, um, first of all, of course, defending the homeland, but maintaining the freedom of the seas, freedom to transit in air, outer space, uh, freedom of, to use cyberspace, uh, maintaining a balance of power uh, in Europe and in Asia uh, through our alliances, as Rudy uh, mentioned in his comments, as Dove did as well, um, and then uh, being able to uh, provide for uh, international um, humanitarian needs uh, when disaster strikes, as we have done repeatedly uh, around the world. I would say those are still things that the United States uh, needs to be able to, to do uh, as, a, as a matter of uh, defense policy. And it is something that we have done for the last 60 years. We have provided global public goods. And I think what the um, events of the last uh, month and a half, and I would both include the budgetary issues, but also uh, the debate over Syria, have begun, I think, to, uh, for the first time in my adult lifetime, call uh, that into question. That is to say, call into question whether the United States is willing to continue to provide these global public goods. Uh, in 1962, December 1962, President Kennedy gave an interview with, to Bill Lawrence on ABC News after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in that interview, he talked about the fatigue after 17 years of national exertion since the end of World War II that Americans felt uh, at having had to provide uh, global leadership. Well, now we're you know, 60 years on, and clearly uh, we are uh, going to have to have that national debate now because the traditional uh, coalition politically on the Hill that existed when Rudy was the uh, chair or was the uh, staff director of the HASC, working for the, the then chairman uh, of Blue Dog Democrats and internationalist Republicans, uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, most of the Blue Dogs uh, have been defeated; they're not in the Congress anymore, and the Republican conference is now deeply divided uh, between those who continue to believe in a strong international role for the United States and uh, those who uh, believe that defense spending is no different than any other uh, category in the budget and that it is perfectly useful as trade bait for uh, negotiations over uh, either cutting uh, discretionary domestic spending or um, entitlement spending. And uh, I think we really need to have the debate because we all have grown up and lived in a period where we take it for granted that the United States will play this role, that it will have these kinds of treaty alliances. But when you look back uh, at our national history, if uh, Bob Kagan, who unfortunately is ill today, 
Uh, but if Bob were here, he would point out as a historian that that is really the exception to our national experience, not the rule. Uh, and those of us who have been used to accepting this, uh, as Dove was saying, the consensus position, have gotten a little bit intellectually lazy, I think, about having to make the case for it. Uh, and I think we need to remedy that and need to be able to make the case for why providing these global public goods is still vital to the nation's security and to its future prosperity and to the safety uh, of the world in which we live. Thank you very much, all three. Well, each of you has mentioned the impact of the current budget situation uh, and, and the, the danger I think it presents to the ability of the United States to carry out its foreign policy. Um, it's also uh, striking that we've heard uh, various ways to, well, obviously Dr. Zakheim has said that it's necessary, it's difficult to reconstitute a capability once lost. But there is a problem here. It looks like we are not going to be able to do all of that. And so the question I put to all three of you is, how do we get from here to there? How do we get from where we are uh, to where we want to be in five or 10 years? Do you want to take that off? Or, or Doug, since you posed the question, why don't you start off? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to reiterate uh, what Eric said. I actually have a blog or a piece in uh, yesterday's National Interest that went after explicitly the uh, congressional supporters of the Tea Party. Um, what those folks don't seem to understand, and, and it's not isolationism, it's ignorance, is that America's economic security, which they as well as we all care about, really depends on stability. And stability depends on the United States' ability to maintain its military capability. That has been the underpinning of international stability. And so these you know, quarterly reports, as it were, where every quarter or every four months, you have no idea where the United States is going to be, uh, leads people to ask what I have been asked by foreign, foreigners from every part of the world. Are you guys crazy? That is not a way to promote stability. Now, to answer your question directly, as long as we've got this madness going on, and, and you know, let's say the sequester disappeared tomorrow, you still got the cuts from the uh, 2011 legislation, which is about $47 billion a year, not trivial money, uh, even in the Pentagon. Um, clearly, there have to be some things done that have not been done. And, and when Eric says we have to take things seriously, I think that's right. Uh, the Pentagon is not managed well. I think there are efforts to manage it well. We've all, in our different jobs, done our best to try to manage it well. But the bottom line is it's not managed well. We have too many civil servants. We have too many contractors. We have an acquisition system that is so bad that we set up a new rapid acquisition system to get around our own acquisition system. Something wrong with that picture. We have defense agencies that are Fortune 500 companies that are managed by GS-14s. Now, could you imagine a GS-14 running ExxonMobil or Amazon? or any, frankly, any of the NFL teams, except perhaps the Redskins. Um, we have to rethink how we manage budgets, because let's face it, even with the cuts, we're talking about budgets in excess of $400 billion a year. That's a lot of money, and it has to be spent well. We have too many facilities, and Congress has to do something about BRAC. We clearly have to get our arms around health care. $49 billion a year this year for health care. Got to do something about that. Without hurting the people who've signed up, everything has to be grandfathered. But the fact is, just by changing the way we calculate retirement, the actuaries say we can save billions right now. So there's things we can do. But what we shouldn't do, and I'll reiterate what I said before, is eliminate those capabilities that we will bitterly regret not having should some new contingency come up that, of course, we didn't foresee. Rudy, you want to take the next shot? Well, 
so those were good comments. Let me sort of get at them in a slightly different way. Um, Ambassador Edelman mentioned that we were both on the QDR commission together um, back in 2010. And so most of the debate in Washington right now with the sequester and the four-month continuing appropriations has been what is the top line for DOD going to be? But I think embedded is, is that the real problem in the DOD budget are the cost assumptions that now are impacting the top line, obviously. Um, the fact is, is that the all-volunteer force got very expensive in the last decade, and we ought to be concerned that it's not sustainable in the coming decades. I don't think the country wants anything other than an all-volunteer military. But that means that it has to work for the long term, that it has to be affordable, and it has to be able to bring in great people uh, and then compensate them fairly, but then also provide for uh, the other elements of defense, logistics, modernization, things like that. So we've got to look at some of the things that are driving costs right now. On the acquisition side, I think the Google generation needs to get in touch with the Boeing and Lockheed generation because our platforms um, are becoming more and more the integ integration of multiple information systems to run the ship, to notify of threats, to communicate back to the headquarters, to receive updated intelligence. And so as platforms become essentially uh, integrated flying computers um, with pilots or aviators or operators um, in control, we've got to bring these generations together. One of them wears white shirts and ties like we do, and the other wears fleeces and may shave every other day, but they're just as smart, just as capable, and they have lived in these new information te technologies, these new architectures. So. We're at a period where, where the cost drivers of defense, the cost of personnel, the cost of new equipment, we can't continue to maintain those cost drivers because no top line in the world will get us the right amount of equipment and the right amount of people if we maintain those embedded cost structures. I think the other thing is, is that we need to figure out um, how we can work across the aisle more regularly on national security issues. Serving in the Clinton administration, um, I had a Republican Secretary of Defense, uh, Bill Cohen. Uh, Les Aspen, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, was regularly working with the Reagan White House on big foreign policy initiatives and later President George H.W. Uh, Bush as well on the key issue of uh, Iraqi freedom in 19, uh, Desert Storm in 1991. So how we can cross the aisle and talk to each other when, in fact, the main dialogue in Washington has moved from committee rooms and caucus rooms to you know, blogs and talk shows where we focus on our differences rather than our ability to make compromises. And then, you know, Dove mentioned that we'd get more revenue from the uh, energy supplies that we're developing domestically. We'd also get a lot more revenue uh, in terms of our budget if we would pass the immigration bill and bring the sort of uh, closed economy, um, the off-budget economy, uh, into the mainstream economy. But all of those things require that we sort of cross the aisle and work with each other. And you know, I'm at a loss. Maybe it, as, as, as maybe the exception was the Cold War years, where we had less political intrigue and less political fighting. But we've got to figure out how to do things that are not just simply common sense, but also to do things that are going to be hard to do. Uh, the coalition between Les Aspen, Sam Nunn, and President Reagan on passing the Goldwater Nichols, the military reforms in 1986, probably the most significant thing that's happened to DOD uh, in the last 30 years, but that was crossing the aisle. So we've got to figure out how to work together, and then, you know, no top line in the world is going to satisfy our national security requirements if we don't deal with these cost drivers that are uh, there and present every day. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on both what Dove and Rudy have said, uh, if you look at the 
big downturns in defense spending uh, that we have been through before after World War II, after Korea, after Vietnam, after the end of the Cold War. In each instance, uh, we were able to generate considerable savings because the size of the end strength of the force had grown considerably in each of those conflicts. And so largely, savings could be derived by cutting the size of the Army, the Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, et cetera. Um, what's different about uh, the current situation is over the last 10 years, uh, end strength really hasn't increased that much. Um, but the expense of the force has, uh, as both Rudy said and as my colleague Todd Harrison uh, was quoted by Brad as saying. Um, and so that does mean that uh, Rudy is absolutely right. We have to get at the embedded costs. Uh, it's really a microcosm in some sense of the entitlement problem that we face as a nation that's embedded inside the DOD budget, and it will be very difficult to do politically. Um, I think personnel costs over the last decade have grown at 4.2% per annum, adjusted for inflation. And if you project that out, as my colleague Todd Harrison has done, I think in 2024, it, it becomes the entire DOD budget. Now, that's not going to happen, obviously. But what it does highlight is the danger of kind of crowding out uh, other um, defense investments and, and uh, acquisitions and capabilities that we're going to need in the future. Uh, Brad talked a little bit, and Dove, I think, uh, was talking as well, about uh, how do we make sure we have the right mix of capabilities that we want in the future. And there is a question of do you trade off uh, current capacity or readiness uh, for you know, future capability. There's just, uh, even, at, you know, even if we're look, looking at only 500 billion in cuts over 10 years as opposed to the trillion plus from sequestration, money's got to come from somewhere. Um, and you know, there are only a limited number of uh, places where you can you know, generate that from. Secretary Hagel uh, and Admiral Winnefeld, the vice chairman, uh, when they announced the, review, the uh, results of the strategic choices and management review back in July, said explicitly that they wanted to prioritize uh, and emphasize maintenance of future capability and were willing to take some risk in, in current, you know, current capacity. And I think in a kind of ideal world, all of us would say that. Um, but I would say that there is a bit of a danger. And one of the things that we really haven't talked about in the panel, but I, I think we need to put on the table as well, is you know, we, we need to make sure that as we do this, as we try and figure out what the future capability is, number one, that we don't become victims of the belief that the current program of record is necessarily what we need in 20 years hence, because there's a danger that bureaucratically the um, elements of the Department of Defense that are invested in the current program of record will defend it, uh, and that other promising capabilities and technologies will be shortchanged in, in the process. Secondly, I do think we have to make sure we don't end up like uh, Britain between the wars. I mean, Britain between the wars essentially prioritized future capability over current capacity by enacting a 10-year rule that said, we're not going to go to war over the next 10 years. I mean, of course, as Dove points out, you don't know whether you're going to go to war or not or what kind of war you're going to fight. History has a way of imposing itself on you that sometimes not all that convenient. Uh, but the Brits rolled the 10-year rule forward every year until they got to the late 30s when they decided they actually needed to rearm in the face of uh, German aggressive policy and, and rearmament. But by the time they got there, they discovered that their procurement policies in the 20s and 30s had essentially destroyed Britain's shipbuilding industry, and they were unable to really uh, engage in the naval buildup that they need to. We've gotten very used to in this country since 1945, not thinking about or worrying about the impact of defense budgets and defense budget cuts on the defense industrial base. But I think we've now reached a point where we don't have that luxury anymore, and we really need to think very carefully about what will the impact be of certain cuts on the supply chain and on the defense industrial base. I take your point about uh, talking about the programs of record not allowing those 
sunk costs to be a driver of what we do, but it's always been a driver. The, the problem is breaking some of these habits that you mentioned, the habit of not thinking about the industrial base, the habit of accepting the program of record as the way it's going to be. What can be done to make the changes that, that you suggest? I'll take a shot at that. Uh, begin with an anecdote. When I came into the Reagan administration in 81, it was uh, at the time the president and Mr. Weinberger were talking about a buildup, changing the way we were doing things. There had been a, an election campaign that focused heavily on defense. And I remember meeting uh, with uh, a bunch of uh, two-star level folks, and the Army two-star at the time says, it doesn't matter what your secretary says. This is what he said. I never forgot this. doesn't matter what your secretary says. We have a five-year defense pro plan, and he's stuck. And of course, everybody knows that that turned out not to be the case. I guess what I'm pointing to is leadership. The only way you can affect change in any institution, and particularly in an institution that's as hierarchical as the Pentagon, is from the top. If the Commander-in-Chief, the Secretary of Defense want to change, there will be change. People will salute and do it. Don't expect them to do it by themselves. Don't expect it to come from the bottom up. That's not the way it works. You cannot change that culture and, frankly, any corporate culture unless it comes from the top. And it doesn't come from one individual. I have seen, over the course of my career, undersecretaries for acquisition, that way I'm not focusing on my guys to the right and left, come in and leave, each with a new buzzword. They're going to change things. And so the staff repeats the buzzword till the new person comes in with a new organization chart and a new buzzword, and nothing changes. So what you need is not a secretary of defense, but all secretaries of defense to be consistent about the changes if you get that, if it doesn't become a sin to inherit what your predecessor did and to carry it forward, then you'll get progress. But if every time a new person comes in, you toss it all up again and you start all over, you're not going to get anything done. And that's bipartisan. Doesn't matter who's there. All right, so we've talked a lot about things for in the United States, in the Pentagon, on Capitol Hill, in the White House, things to do, things to think about. Uh, as this is the foreign policy initiative, maybe we should turn our view outward for a moment. Uh, last year, the, the defense strategic guidance was issued and uh, talked um, about the thing that's become known as the Asia pivot. Uh, the Syrian situation, along with the Arab Spring and, and several other things, have shown that it's not so easy to make that pivot. I wonder what you gentlemen have uh, think about that uh, strategy and what it means for the defense we need. Well, let me say one, uh, make one observation. I mean, I, I think uh, Dove adverted in his earlier comments to um, the fact that the United States is increasingly becoming energy self-sufficient. I, I wouldn't say independent because I don't think we're ever truly uh, going to be energy independent, but we are becoming more self-sufficient with tight oil and shale gas and other forms of, of hydrocarbon energy coming onto the market. Um, and I think in some quarters that has made people think uh, that uh, the Middle East, in which we have been very heavily invested uh, for much of the last, um, you know, two and a half decades, uh, is not important anymore, or we can relegate it to a kind of secondary position, and that we can then just sort of uh, reallocate our attention to the Far East. There's no doubt that we need to be spending plenty of, of time and attention on East Asia. I don't have any doubt of that. Uh, there's been a giant flow of, of uh, wealth and economic activity uh, to East Asia, and the United States has always been both an Atlantic and a Pacific power. We clearly now have to give some more attention uh, to the Pacific, but I, I don't think it's going to be so easy to just disengage ourselves uh, from, um, from the Middle East. Even if we end up 
with no residual force in Afghanistan. I think we still are going to um, uh, be uh, engaged there uh, because, number one, oil remains a globally traded commodity, and the price of oil, even if we're not getting a lot of it from the Middle East, uh, can affect the U.S. economy. And more to the point, it will very, uh, very much affect our treaty allies in Europe and in Asia, who are still very dependent on those sources of hydrocarbon energy. So I think it's going to be much more difficult. Dove and I did write an op-ed together uh, about the so-called rebalance, and one of the things that worries me a bit about the rebalance is that there has been a, a, a little bit more talk than reality to it, in the sense that the rebalance, if you look at in terms of the military uh, assets that have been rebalanced, um, you're really talking essentially about a rotational deployment of 2,500 Marines to Darwin, Australia, four littoral combat ships home ported in Singapore, and an increase in exercises uh, of the type we've already been doing, really, with the Philippines, all of which is good, um, but, um, but not sufficient, I think, to really uh, uh, carry the day with our treaty allies in terms of reassuring them that in an area of growing anti-access area denial capabilities that the United States will be able to come to their defense and meet its treaty obligations. Even the repositioning of the U.S. Navy uh, from the Atlantic to the Pacific is occurring uh, against a backdrop of uh, overall declining size of the Navy. So the net plus up in capability is not too great. So I, I, I worry a little bit that we should not be um, talking a big game about a, a you know a, a rebalance, uh, but need to be more focused on actually uh, producing more uh, uh, military assets that uh, can change the uh, calculations of folks in in the Western Pacific. Just uh, before we start doing the Q's and A's with the audience, which is very important, just uh, perhaps an alternative view on the rebalance in Asia. I think uh, well, there was a feeling that we really had neglected Asia uh, as the Americans were very much involved and focused on Iraq and Afghanistan um, in the last decade. And so if we were to look at uh, the U.S. and Asia, it is as indispensable as ever. Uh, our military alliances have been reinvigorated uh, in part uh, because of uh, the tremendous uh, economic role that North Korea plays, let alone the threat that they have with Kim Jong-un and the nuclear program uh, in North Korea. Um, but then also uh, our relations with Japan have been very much reinvigorated. Secretary Panetta, Secretary Hagel making regular visits there. So we've spent some time uh, in an area where we hadn't spent a lot of time uh, because uh, our forces were were, were deployed to the, to the Middle East. So I think that we've got to look at the rebalance to Asia as more than just simply a um, military strategy. It really is a national security foreign policy strategy. The Middle East, uh, you know, as much as we think that uh, there's a path forward, is going to continue to demand more attention. It really goes back to FDR meeting with the king um, you know, we've got some number of good books out there, The Lawrence of Arabia, um, which really talks about the breakup of the colonial era, which was a combination of World War I, but definitely World War II, that the breakup of the colonial era, era left the Middle East in a much different position. And so America playing that role of the broker has had a tremendous stabilizing influence in the region. Now, um, some of it is the rise of uh, radical uh, Islam. Some of it is a huge demographic bulge. But all of these things make it harder. I'll tell one last story. My, what, my first week on Capitol Hill as a young staffer was 1975. Eric and Dove weren't even, they were probably in high school in those days. <laughs> but Sadat came. And this was five years before Camp David. But it was a huge strategic moment because Egypt had been aligned with the Soviet Union. And when Sadat came, it was a realignment to the West. 
And that was a critical building block uh, for the United States in the region, part of a peace process that every president has, has worked to go forward. But when Sadat came in that moment in November 1975, the population of Egypt was about 30 million. It had a very prosperous middle class. Today, the population of Egypt is 85 to 90 million. And so the, the economic tools of how you keep a dynamic middle class uh, with uh, three times the population that you prior had is a huge challenge of economic strategy. And all of the political fissures that crack underneath can be reflected by there just simply aren't enough jobs for young people uh, in the region, but particularly in Egypt right now. And so some of these, the United States can have a big stabilizing impact. Some of them have to be solved internal to those, those countries. But um, I would agree with um, Ambassador Edelman that you know, the, the United States role is going to be important in Asia, but we're there in the Middle East because we've been the broker and we've helped it uh, avoid big wars. And I think that's our challenge now for the future. Did you want to take a crack at it? Or you? No, I think it's question time. Isn't OK, it? it is question time. Here's one. What do you see as the future for major platforms, like the Long Range Bomber, that desperately need replacements in the next decade? I think that uh, we have to be judicious about what we get. Um, the Long Range Bomber raises a very interesting question, because there have been debates about manned bombers for strategic nuclear forces for a long time. On the other hand, if you're going to move away from nuclear forces, then the long-range bombers still might be exceedingly useful to you. And if you're focusing on the Pacific, where there are vast tracts of, of ocean uh, and uncertainty about your bases, then again, a long-range bomber may make some sense. I, I guess what I'm saying is uh, the jury is still out. But we have to be, uh, avoid knee-jerk responses. Um, there have been, our debates over defense systems have tended to be very, very stylized. You have four carriers or you have fewer carriers, more carriers, no bombers, yes bombers. I think we're going to have to be a lot more subtle about what we do. The mixes of capabilities we have, and, and Rudy talked about that, uh, are different. Uh, and there are areas where we clearly are ahead of everyone else, and we want to make sure we stay that way. Um, so I would say on long-range bombers, we probably still want to work on developing them. How far we go is still something to be determined. Okay. All right, next one we have, how involved militarily are we likely to be in the future in Africa? I know, Rudy, you just mentioned Egypt. Um, Ambassador, do you want to take that one? Uh, probably more than we will want to be. Um, uh, the, uh, again, a, a panel that uh, Rudy and I served on uh, three years ago ad identified a number of trends that uh, were going to be important for the nation's uh, defense and future security, one of which was something that Secretary Gates had identified as a problem, which is the threat um, to our and global security that is represented by frail, um, failing, or failed states. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we've had you know, several instances in, in um, Africa of this. Uh, we just had in, in, in Kenya recently a reminder of the spillover effect um, that um, the chronically failed state of Somalia has generated for you know, much of the last 20 years. Our French allies, uh, I think, did a, a very good job of uh, going into Mali, but with they required some U.S. support, lift, and assistance. Um, we still, I don't know, uh, that we have completely seen the last of the uh, second and third, third order consequences of the success of uh, Operation Odyssey Dawn and the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime. Um, and you know, again, uh, there are some. Uh, energy security uh, issues in Africa, in the Gulf of Guinea, in Nigeria, um, where um, state frailty um, may have some broader international implications that will you know, be called upon, will call upon the U.S. to play a role. And not to mention, uh, 
kind of humanitarian um, issues or just sort of kind of law and order uh, issues like the search for Joseph Kony and things like that. So I, I suspect we will uh, be involved in, in Africa um, you know, much more than we anticipated. When we set up AFRICOM, uh, it was not intended to be a, um, a combatant command uh, that you know, was a war fighting combatant command. Yet, to prove Dove's adage that you never know where you're going to end up fighting, uh, shortly after uh, General Ham became the second commander of AFRICOM, he was fighting a war. Um, and I think uh, you know, that's just indica indicative of what we are likely to face there you know, over the next decade. Uh, here's one from Twitter. Uh, in a time of straightened budgets and continued strategic nuclear overmatch, is it time to reduce our nuclear arsenal? You know, like the bomber, I think we need to make smart decisions about how we deploy all of our forces. The strategic forces have been very pivotal to uh, the stability. I think the proliferation issue has to be at the top of the list because the countries that have been um, there with nuclear weapons have understood the rules that if you use a nuclear weapon, it's going to be catastrophic. And so uh, holding the spread of those weapons, whether it's in Iran or uh, in North Korea or other places that we can only guess right now, um, I think is, is the biggest challenge. With respect, there's a whole question of follow-on systems, of the replacement for the Ohio-class submarine, and in addition to um, the bomber question, that will you know, require a lot of sharpening the pencils to make sure these programs are affordable, because I think we know that with some of the programs, you can price yourself as pivotal as they may be, and I think we learned this from Secretary Cheney during his tenure as Secretary of Defense, that there are some programs where they can cost themselves out and no longer be relevant because you, you don't get the, the effectiveness in terms of what would the same amount if it were spent on soldiers or if it were spent on, on, on ships. But I think we do need to look at uh, the size of our nuclear arsenal. I think um, some changes can be made I think we need to size them in terms of what the United States feels its requirement is and look at that and then uh, size the force accordingly. All right, and I think this is a good question to end on given the concern expressed by our three panelists here today. How do we get back to bipartisan defense? Well, since these two guys already spoke about it as well, um, Getting back's not going to be easy. And I think at the end of the day, getting back is the responsibility of the voters of this country. What informed folks like all of you and presumably those who will be watching this, if they care enough to watch it, they're probably reasonably informed. Informed people have to put the word out that you just can't mess with defense. You can disagree. You can disagree about how many nuclear weapons you should have or how many carriers you should have. Those are, those are disagreements that are based on a fundamental acceptance of the fact that this country's prosperity and way of life depends on its national security. That has, what, has been what governed both Congress and administrations for 60 years, certainly for our professional lifetime. But it's up to the voters. And if our voters do not understand this and are fed all kinds of pap to lead them to believe that defense is, as I think uh, Eric said, just another trade-off with entitlements or whatever, then we're going to have a serious problem because they're going to elect people who believe the same thing. And I don't think we can afford that. Well, I, there's not much to add to what Dove said, but maybe one thing, which is <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, folks who, you know, in recent years have talked about the importance of, you know, getting back to uh, 
you know, a stricter adherence to the Constitution. To those folks, I would just point out that in the Constitution, the number one obligation of the federal government is to provide for the common defense. And, and by the way, it's the only obligation that is mandated, not optional for them. They may do other things, but they must provide for the common defense. And I think uh, we need to get more folks, as Dove was saying, elected to office who understand that that's their primary responsibility. So I think, Brad, a good question, and my two colleagues on the panel have made, made good, good comments. I think you know, when, the, when the Truman guys were writing the Marshall Plan, Robert Lovett, who would later be Secretary of Defense and who was one of those pillars of the establishment voice on national security, noted that you know, America's security was rooted in its unique economic strength. And so as we talk about our defense needs um, and to provide for the common defense, as um, the ambassador just mentioned, I think that um, we've got to figure out, one, how do we do a budget here in Washington uh, that we can actually uh, manage all of the pillars of defense, of entitlements, of revenues, not make them a political Donnybrook each time we have those debates. But then also, I think fundamentally, looking at um, our own economy uh, to build the next generation, because just as we need volunteers to serve um, in the armed forces, we need young people that can go into the high-tech sector or into the medical or pharmaceutical or the transportation sectors. And you know, where our college students today um, are graduating with a huge burden of debt that previous generations haven't had. So we've got to figure out how do we get the economy generating jobs for our own young Americans who have all of these, these great skills. And that means that our leaders are going to have to work together. Um, you know, George Herbert Walker Bush did a big budget deal with Dick Gebhardt and um, George Mitchell. Uh, President Reagan did a big social security bill with Tip O'Neill where both sides had to give. Um, we seem to have lost that capability in the era of AM talk radio and you know blogs where we accentuate our differences. Somehow, we're gonna have to figure out how we find the area in the middle that we can all work, work toward. I think that's a fine sentiment tonight. Could we all please have a hand for our panelists here? Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you.